In this book, Jeff Thompson, self-protection specialist, discusses grappling for self-defense. Hi guys, my name is Joe, and welcome to my channel, Fighting Words, the Martial Arts Library. On this channel, I review martial arts books and talk about other martial arts-related subjects. The subject for today's review is Real Grappling by Jeff Thompson, originally published in 1994. My copy is from 1998. Now, this is part of Mr. Thompson's Real series, which includes real punching, real kicking, real head, knees, and elbows, and real self-defense. Uh, I've re reviewed the first three, have yet to get to the last one. Uh, Mr. Thompson is a self-protection specialist. Uh, he started off in Shotokan Karate, uh, realized he was still afraid of getting into fights. <laughs> he was afraid of violence. So he became a bouncer in Coventry for nine years. And during that time, he also picked up things like boxing, judo, wrestling, etc. The first chapter of this book is actually written by Dave Turton, who, at the time of writing, was a six-degree black belt in a traditional Japanese martial art called Yawara. And that just gives a sort of a historical overview of grappling, uh, how it's been practiced everywhere from ancient Egypt to Japan to medieval England. Uh, following that, we get a couple chapters on the very fundamentals of grappling, chapter two, is on stances, and it presents both a defensive stance, which wrestlers would, might refer to as a square stance, as well as an offensive stance, which wrestlers would probably recognize as a staggered stance, where one foot is more in front of the other. Uh, those of you with traditional martial arts backgrounds will at least recognize the lower body positions resembling things like a horse stance or a back stance. Chapter 3 covers various grips. Uh, he makes a note that for the street, you know, you can take any sort of grips, although he does show a few different grips regarding the body lock. Shows the fingers hooked together, grabbing your own wrists, and also going palm to palm. He also notes in this section that because you are preparing for a street altercation, that when you're in the clinch, probably keep your chin tucked so you're not going to be vulnerable to headbutts. Chapter 4 is the most extensive chapter in this book. Uh, it's on vertical grappling, and to be honest, there's a lot of stuff in here that most would not think of as grappling. He includes a lot of strikes. Uh, this is, again, presented as being sort of an all-in self-defense type of situation. So, for instance, uh, he talks about you know, headbutts has an extensive section on that. Uh, talks about the primary targets for hand techniques being the jaw and the eyes. And he actually demonstrates several different attacks to the eyes with the fingers. He actually has a two-page uh, section in here on the use of the bite. You know, not so much on a technical aspect, but more like, you know, strategic, I guess. Uh, he does detail a few basic chokes and from there moves on to like lower body strikes. So like knees to the body and the groin, uh, stomps to the ankle, uh, low kicks to the shin. Um, of course, the typical, you know, snap kick to the groin. This is a pretty extensive section. It's the longest chapter of the book. It almost feels like it could be a book in and of itself. Uh, chapter five is on throws and you know he discusses gripping for the throws a little bit sort of in passing most of what he demos is from sort of a, a sort of a headlock wrap around position most of the throws that are demonstrated are what you would find in judo so we're talking like it, it, he doesn't use the term but body drop throw that's a taiotoshi um you know, your Harai Goshi, Uchimadas, things like that, including a few foot sweeps like Osotogari. I think that's the first one he shows. He will mention on a lot of them that it can be reversed. He doesn't really discuss anything beyond that. 
In addition to all these, we get a double leg takedown, which at the time in judo was legal. It was known as morotagari, or double leg reap, I guess. Strategy-wise, he suggests preceding them with a distraction, you know, like a headbutt or a bite or a strike of some sort. And he also notes that while you can see, like, fancy fainting and grip fighting between, you know, two competitive athletes, that's typically unnecessary for the street because the guy on the other side isn't going to be trained in all this and he's not going to recognize that you're fainting a grip in order to open up for a different grip. Uh, following that is chapter 6, which is on the ground. And he divides it into two different types of fighting. There's fighting from the ground, which he covers briefly, and both of the opponents being on the ground. Now, fighting from the ground, you're down, the opponent's standing. He basically says, you know, shell up, take any kind of kicks on your arms and legs. Basically, you know, get fetal <laughs> until you can get back to your feet. Now, when he gets to the section where both people are on the floor, uh, he does say toward the end of the chapter that he has chosen a certain specific, like, pins and holds because they give you an opportunity to get back to your feet, you know, as opposed to certain other ones. Uh, we get some hold downs that are common in judo, like we get the scarf hold and the reverse scarf hold. Um, we also get a few things in the way of like neck cranks. Uh, there's actually an arm bar in there. But again, most of them are just hold downs. And yeah, they do give you an opportunity to get your feet under you and pop back up. Following that is a short little two-page chapter on finger locks. He presents three of them, but he will also note that they don't really play a major role in self-defense. He calls them rainy day techniques. After that, we get chapter eight, which is on combinations. The first part of the chapter talks about basically setting up your throw from the clinch with strikes. So he offers some examples of that, like going for a headbutt before going for, you know, a back heel trip. Um, later on in the chapter, he discusses combining the throws themselves. He does point out that this is an advanced concept. But then he does offer, you know, some examples of, you know, okay, you try a hip throw and the guy moves around. Well, here's a good time for an inside sweeping throw or something like that. The following three chapters will be familiar to anyone you know, who's seen my other reviews, they are how to use this particular skill of grappling, you know, closing the distance, clinching, taking the fight to the ground, against a kicking specialist, a punching specialist, and a street fighter. Against the kicker, he more or less talks about catching or jamming the kick, and also evading and then coming in while the guy's sort of recovering from the kick. Against the punches, he more or less lists, you know, like different slips and ducks and things like that, in addition to guarding up or just rushing in and again jamming. Uh, when it comes to the Street Fighter, he gives a, a brief introductory on, you know, this is someone who isn't going to have a large arsenal, but what they have has been tested for them. Uh, he discusses counters against headbutts, bites, and, you know, somebody sticking their fingers in your face. And most of those, you, you counter the bite attempt by taking your head away, then headbutting the guy. You counter the fingers in the eyes by taking your head away, and then biting or controlling and breaking the fingers. So there's basically, how do you counter techniques that are dirty? By using your own dirty techniques. And there's nothing dirty in a street fight. Okay, whatever. Um... But that's sort of your overview for that. Uh, I like chapter 12 because it gives examples of how to use objects in this scenario. Uh, by that, I mean, you know, how to ram somebody into a ledge or slam a door on them or, you know, grabbing a pencil and, you know, jamming it into their, their sensitive areas, as he puts it. So this is sort of like using the environment plus improvised weapons a little bit. You know, he gives examples. Toward the end of the chapter, he does say that, you know, the list could be far more extensive, but this is a good base from which you can begin to think about your own uses of the environment and improvised weapons. The last two chapters are on training. Uh, chapter 13 talks about 
you know, using common equipment like, you know, a punching bag. It talks about using like uh, the belt from a gi. In other words, you know, a traditional martial arts uniform, how you can use that to get used to your throwing techniques. Uh, I think he even mentioned shadow boxing there. And then he lists a few particular like lifts concerning like weightlifting, you know, like um, bench press and military press. Chapter 14 seems a little bit redundant. <laughs> This is like further training, running, and weightlifting, but you already covered weightlifting. But there it is. As far as the pros go, uh, I really liked the chapter on upright grappling and the various tools that he listed being used there. Uh, I like the chapter on, you know, using the environment to you know, help you, in, you know, again, ram the guy into something that sticks out, you know, trip him over a curb. Okay. Um, these are things that we typically don't find in a more sterile training environment. And it's things that through his work as a bouncer, he's, you know, got some experience in. Uh, I do like that it's a mixture of fundamental and advanced ideas. I'd say advanced more in the way of like some of the throws and, you know, how to, the, the strategies against, you know, kickers and punchers and things like that. You know, but also covers some, again, just very fundamental things like, here's how you grip your hand, this or this or this. Okay, you know, that's important to know. And of course, there aren't a whole lot of sources that cover clinch fighting or ground fighting for the street by someone who actually has both training and experience in these things. As far as the cons go, honestly, not much to complain about. As I mentioned, it gets a little redundant in, in some places, you know, how chapter 14 could have been folded into chapter 13 or dismissed entirely. You wouldn't miss anything. Uh, the sections on things like head butts and elbow strikes and knee strikes, well, he did an entire book on that. <laughs> and there's definitely a lot of redundancy when it comes to that. I guess if this were your only book, if you didn't get the whole series, then that would be okay. I have the whole series. So I, I don't know why they weren't all folded into a single volume. So recommendations. Uh, if you are interested in self-defense, this is almost entirely a source for self-defense related things. I would say in particular if you have a judo background because that is sort of the basis of a lot of his grappling here. So, you know, what <laughs> what's the best headbutt to use while I'm setting up Osotogari? <laughs> There's... There's an answer for that in this book. I think it's also beneficial even if you don't have a judo background. I just think it definitely helps if you have one because you can, you're already versed in some of the throwing and throwing combination techniques that he talks about. If you don't have a background, he will actually sort of provide some training tips and ideas if you're just practicing with a friend or, or a training partner outside of a formal class. Uh, I think it's some good ideas for anyone interested in self-defense, particularly when he covers the things like biting and gouging and how to counter them, because I don't know of too many books that actually talk about that. And again, he's got experience. He actually tells a story uh, in his book, Watch My Back, where, you know, he, he was fighting a dude and just sort of ran out of options and just like, I'm just going to bite this guy, because hitting him doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> So, you know, he's been in those environments, he's been in those scraps, so he has experience and he's got an, an analytical mind that sort of takes all that and explains them plainly to the reader. And that's all I have for this week. And, again, this is part of Jeff Thompson's Real series. This is the fourth book that I've covered in that series. I've got one more to go. If you would like to support the channel, or if you'd like to suggest a book for me to review, please consider donating to my coffee account. The link to that will be in the description. And I guess I'll see you guys later. Thank you.